smart wood, and supply chain. We hope you've learned a lot in the first two days of the conference, and we are so excited about the programming in store for today, our most action-packed day of the conference, I do believe. So before we officially begin today, uh, it is our commitment at Washington Conservation Action to acknowledge the land that we occupy. Here in Seattle, we're on the unceded traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the ancestral land of the Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and Duwamish. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities, past, present, and future. We express our gratitude as guests and thank the original and current stewards of this land. We would not be here without their guardianship and connection to the earth. We know that a land acknowledgement is a bare minimum. We encourage all of you to go beyond simply learning about the original stewards and inhabitants, but also to commit to action, like consulting and collaborating with tribal communities, giving land back to tribes, protecting the environment and salmon and the tribal cultures that depend upon them. It means electing officials and judges that understand tribal sovereignty, supporting native led priorities such as land sovereignty, upholding treaty and land rights and much more. The well-being of indigenous peoples are born of their homelands and that makes these lands and waters precious. All of us have the responsibility to treat them with respect and care they deserve and to steward them carefully for the next generation. Please do your part. Thank you. I also want to give another huge thank you to the sponsors of this conference, EcoTrust, EFM Investments and Advisory, Pacific Forest Trust, the Salmon Northwest, and Vibrant Planet Data Commons. We could not pull off this conference without you, and your support and partnership is invaluable. Before we talk about today's presenters, a reminder that the party is not quite over after today. Uh, we'll be gathering tomorrow for a carbon conference happy hour from 4 to 7 p.m. in Two Beers Brewing Company's The Woods Tasting Room, which is in Seattle's Industrial District. Um, please RSVP at the link that will be shared in the chat. So we have four presentations for you today and time for questions and discussion after each. We'll kick off the day with Building the Climate Smart Wood Economy, presented by a coalition of partners centered around the Climate Smart Wood Group, followed at 2.05 by a panel with speakers across the supply chain of forest products originating on lands of the Yakima Nation, featuring Yakima Nation Forestry, Yakima Forest Products, and Prime Forest Products. At 3.05, we'll have a presentation from Microsoft, Selling Construction, and WRNS, with a case study on timber preservation and use throughout the Microsoft Campus Modernization Project in Redmond. And our final 2023 Carbon Conference presentation is Driving Action on Embodied Carbon in Buildings, presented by uh, the U.S. Green Building Council and RMI. So before we jump in, a couple of quick logistical reminders. Uh, the presentations are being recorded, as you may have noticed, and will be posted after the conference. If you'd like to submit questions to the speakers, you can do so in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time during the presentation, and facilitators will then sort through those and use them to lead Q&A after each presentation. If you have technical issues this afternoon, please email Tina, um, whose uh, email address will be posted in the chat. So with all that aside, we will get going. Uh, our first presentation comes from a group and a project uh, Washington Conservation Action is closely involved with. And while I'd be delighted to tell you all about the amazing work of the Climate Smart Wood Group and our new Climate Smart Commodities Grant, we'd rather you hear from other expert voices central to this work. So Aaron Everett will facilitate the session and I'll introduce him briefly before he takes the mic. So Aaron is a forester by training and the director of the Climate Smart Wood Group. Prior to founding Beacon Rock Consultants in 2021, Aaron worked in public affairs in the Inslee administration and with the Washington Department of Natural Resources. Aaron, thanks so much for being here today and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks to WCA for hosting this discussion and, and to you personally for all the hard work and acumen that you've uh, invested in this effort. So uh, with that, we will dive into building the climate smart wood economy and, uh, and, and help you kick off this action-packed afternoon. Uh, joining me today are a number of our colleagues from the Climate Smart Wood Group and its coalition. Uh, so you'll hear from them uh, in turn. And next slide, please. Uh, two back. <laughs> there you go. So first, we'll uh, provide you a bit of an over of overview and introduction to the work of the Climate Smart Wood Group. Uh, second, you'll hear from Sustainable Northwest about the broad contours of uh, uh, an ambitious project uh, under a USDA grant in its Climate Smart Commodities Program. Uh, Thirdly, you'll hear about an incentivizing climate smart force management from Seth at NNRG. And lastly, uh, our colleagues at uh, Vibrant Planet Data Commons will talk about the uh, quantitative approaches to measuring the impact of this work. 
So next slide, please. And first up is just a quick Climate Smart Wood Group uh, introduction for you. Next slide. We believe that the building sector needs easy choices to source transparent, traceable, climate smart, mass timber, and other wood products as a powerful force in decarbonizing the built environment and achieving real benefits for climate change, nature, and people. That's the reason uh, in summation that the Climate Smart Wood Group exists. And so I'll take the next slide to unpack that a bit. And uh, it's important because the reality of business as usual is that it presents a number of challenges, and that is that it is not currently easy for the building sector to source that material. Uh, the existing wood supply chain is not particularly transparent and traceable in the same way that other building materials are from a comparability standpoint. Um, you, you don't always have a, a, a verifiable set of data to work from with respect to measurable carbon impacts around alternative forestry choices. And as we know, uh, the choices that you make around harvest regimes in the woods have vastly different consequences from a carbon standpoint, not to mention uh, all the rest of the variables that many of these other presentations at the conference have talked about. Um, it, it, it is not currently easy to differentiate uh, different types of, of material from generic commodity stuff that you would get on the shelf at a big box store, or if you're a you know, mass timber fabricator that you might buy off a rail car uh, with respect to its climate attributes. And we think that the building sector needs to be able to at least make that choice. And if you're finally a, uh, a company that has a significant portfolio, whether it's from a real estate or procurement standpoint, it's pretty difficult to align your ecological and social and equity and climate goals with uh, wood purchasing right now because it's not very well quantified and it's, it takes a lot of extra effort to try and uh, uh, Put some real numbers around those attributes if you care about them. Next slide, please. So we've put together a, uh, a coalition to see this mission to reality. And you know, we were looking for the, the credibility and the drive and the expertise necessary to really sort of make this initiative uh, successful across a North American scale. And for that reason, uh, we've populated the coalition with the expertise of climate smart forestry practitioners and green market development networks like Sustainable Northwest and NNRG uh, and the excellent work that uh, uh, the New England Forestry Foundation does around that subject. We've uh, built ourselves the highest order, in my opinion, of expertise in embodied carbon and green building systems, both uh, broadly across the building sector and specific to forestry. And so we enjoy the benefit of EcoTrust's expertise in that arena, as well as ILFI and Carbon Leadership Forum, which are organizations, if you're not familiar with them uh, and care about carbon in the built environment, I, I highly recommend uh, uh, tapping into them. Uh, we've got the leadership uh, that we need, I think, from sustainability-focused sustainability design firms in the building sector, Bora Architects and Interiors, uh, Don Davies at Davies Crooks Associates, who's a, an emeritus um, official or sorry, a principal at uh, Magnuson Clemensic Associates uh, are, are sort of leading minds in uh, helping us stay grounded in what the building sector really needs from us. And uh, we have internationally recognized paragons of conservation ethic and practice in the form of World Wildlife Fund and FSC. And these are organizations, as you know, that well understand supply chains and the forest sector and help us uh, uh, direct our, our efforts in, uh, in the most effective way possible. And of course, most of all, Washington Conservation Action. Couldn't do it without Washington Conservation Action. So at the next slide, I'm proud to uh, plug this group of sustainability leaders from the architecture, engineering, and construction sector. And these are firms who have both the knowledge and passion for climate smart wood sourcing uh, to make all this work in the real world. And, and we welcome them as inaugural members here a couple months back. And we're adding to this group uh, in a, a pretty fast paced way to try and take on the, uh, again, the, the reach and the expertise within the sector to speak the language of builders who care about this. And we're also very, very proud to add sort of the beginnings of a transcontinental climate smart forestry coalition around, uh, I mentioned New England Forestry Foundation a moment ago, and then also Forest Stewards Guilds were part of our inaugural membership group. Uh, next slide, just to give you a quick look at how we do our work, uh, we've got sort of Four main areas that we're, we're focusing in for the purposes of kind of summarizing it. We're trying to gain adoption of climate smart wood procurement within the building sector and we have a number of different ways we go about that. Um, the one I'll highlight here 
is our procurement guidance and resources, which we recently revised and released at the Green Build 2023 conference in DC. You can check those out along with the rest of our materials on our, our website. But these are a series of several different procurement options and uh, best practices at different decision points within the life of a building project, as well as some uh, pilot specification language approaches, which is something that the sector told us that they needed to try and get their hands on uh, uh, transparent, traceable, climate smart material in a systematic way. And so we've got that out for peer review and, and sort of a collaborative development process now and hope to be putting it on the ground uh, beginning in the new year. Um, I'd also say that uh, I, I hope you'll stick around to listen to RMI and uh, and Greenbuild, or sorry, uh, LEED, talk about their uh, recent publication because they leaned on our procurement guidance pretty heavily and we're, we're very proud of that. Um, we also work at the project and portfolio level to help organizations figure out what this means for them if they care about wood sourcing and want to do it uh, in a way that's that's climate smart. Um, our second main area of focus is to make sure that we're connecting the practitioners and supply chain actors with, with the demand that's out there. And you'll hear about one of those uh, initiatives in particular, and that's the subject of the larger presentation we're giving. Um, and related, we're really building this neat leadership network of practitioners and and. Uh, 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 allies across North America to make the connections that are necessary to do this at scale. And obviously, uh, there's a long way to go in developing sort of shared uh, and uh, commonly accepted methodologies for measuring impact. And that's uh, another key area of focus that you'll hear about. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, the balance of our presenters. And today, you're going to hear more about how some of these preceding strategies are making their way into the real world. Climate Smart Wood Group is part of a coalition that has launched an ambitious climate smart forestry initiative in the Northwest that is promoting forest health, climate resilience, and carbon storage and connecting those landowners with green builders who want climate smart wood. So this project, as you'll hear, is supported by a $25 million grant from the USDA Climate Smart Commodities Program. And this partnership will work with uh, nearly 200 forest landowners, tribes, local communities, families, and nonprofits to restore forest health using the best available science. So we'll also track our carbon storage and other benefits uh, through the course of implementing this project on the ground and uh, uh, and market the associated climate smart wood products. So uh, finally, we'll uh, uh, create a tool that you'll hear about more later that helps green builders quantify the embodied carbon associated with their wood purchases. So to tell us more about this is Micah Stanowski, who is Senior Green Markets Manager for Sustainable Northwest. Micah works at the intersection of the built and biophysical environments, drawing on dual master's degrees in environmental policy and forest economics, and six years as co-director of the Seattle-based trades training nonprofit called Sawhorse Revolution. So please take it away, Micah. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, good to be here with everybody attending, and thanks to our gracious hosts, uh, Washington Conservation Association. Action, I'm sorry. Washington Conservation Action. Um, yeah, so just a little bit of context on the on the large award that Aaron just introduced. This came through historic investment through the bipartisan infrastructure law passed in late 2021 that uh, totaled three, uh, and this is just one piece of that uh, legislation, but that totaled $3 billion to 141 projects over five years. Um, we were lucky enough to land one of those 141 grants. Um, in USDA's words, this effort will expand markets for America's climate smart commodities, leverage the greenhouse gas benefits of climate smart commodity production, and provide direct meaningful benefits to production agriculture, including for small and underserved producers. So that's the sort of high level framing of what this looks like to the federal government and getting uh, I'm hoping to introduce you all to the specific grant that we're putting on the ground starting really now. We've been working for about six months to do a lot of the sort of infrastructure development, administrative work, and we're really about to start hitting the ground in the next one or two quarters. So as Aaron said, it was a $25 million award over five years. Um, we anticipate working with 190 forest landowners, including seven tribes, and estimate that will directly impact 66,000 acres uh, with restoration and climate smart forestry. 
Um, the award was made to S Sustainable Northwest. I may refer to us as SNW out of shorthand habit there. Um, and seven co-recipients. Um, the project, uh oh, I think the slide, oh, there we go. I, the slide disappeared for me there for a second. Um, the project aims to connect landowners taking action to improve forest health, climate resilience, and carbon storage with green builders who are increasingly demanding this material and measure the progress along the way through a robust data collection and sharing process. Next slide, please. So this is a glimpse of the core team that's putting this work on the ground over the next five years. Um, within the shared structures and coordination of the grant, each of the organizations here holds a relatively distinct scope. We're not gonna go fully into the weeds on all of those scopes today, but I hope to give you a general description of the work that will be divided up among us. Um, next slide, please. So at the high level, the work divides into three form, three main activities. The first is landowner support. Um, within the grant, we have $10 million, a little over $10 million that will go in direct payments and incentives to uh, small tribal nonprofit and community forests, um, plus another 5 million in other direct technical assistance to producers. Um, market development and storytelling to increase recognition of the opportunity to purchase wood from the region's amazing climate smart producers and impact measurement using satellite data to accurately estimate forest and body carbon and, at, and attribute this to climate smart wood products. Next slide, please. Here's one step deeper, a little bit of a flow chart for how this grant will uh, unroll in the next five years. Um, so on the left there, you've got the sum total of the direct producer payments and incentives that will go towards increasing the supply of, of uh, climate smart wood product available to the market. Um, this is supported by the impact measurement to quantify the additional carbon storage associated with those products and forest actions and results in our collective ability to trace climate smart wood through the supply chain and connect with buyers primarily at commercial scale at this point in time, but over five years, maybe we'll be able to uh, make it available to more markets. Next slide, please. The high level objectives of the grant start and really, really begin with and focus on uh, landowner support. So increasing and, increasing and expanding adoption of climate smart forestry in the Pacific Northwest, training foresters and loggers in climate smart practices, tracking carbon storage that results from this, enabling climate smart wood procurement and increasing market access and recognition for forest management um, by the various landowners that we'll be supporting. Um, I'm going to dive just for a moment into the sort of markets-based work because that's where my organization, Sustainable Northwest, has its focus and also because we'll be hearing more from uh, colleagues around the direct landowner support and uh, impacts measurement after me on this presentation. Next slide, please. So Sustainable Northwest has a 15, over a 15 year history in supporting transparent timber supply chains inside and outside of certification. We developed the trust and network needed to link Pacific Northwest forest products back to impacts at the forest of origin. In recent years, our team has been developing what we've dubbed a wood advisor role, which uh, works inside and outside of certification, works through partnership with mills and manufacturers, forest producers, uh, uh, and uh, building industry partners to do track and trace efforts that allow us to follow wood back through the supply chain and more accurately say what sort of forestry and what sort of ecology um, the wood comes from, and then make more reliable claims about what the positive environmental and social impacts are from that work. This has really taken place mostly at a, at a regional scale and on a project by project scale. It's a distinct hope that through the work of this grant and through the 
partnerships in the Climate Smart Wood Group, that this will begin to scale up and become more repeatable far beyond our region and far larger than Sustainable Northwest is able to or has ambition to do ourselves. Next slide, please. which is where the Climate Smart Wood Group fits in. I won't go into too much more detail because you got a uh, an introduction from Aaron, but the Climate Smart Wood Group really, we see as sitting in the convening, scaling, and building national network and validity for the entire project, for the entire effort um, that will live long beyond the five years of this grant. Um, so it's really the Climate Smart Wood Group that we see as the best option for scaling these efforts beyond the Pacific Northwest and helping the building sector in North America identify and procure Climate Smart Wood products. So next up, you'll hear more about one of the approaches that this grant is putting on the ground to incentivize Climate Smart Forest Management through this grant. Um, coming up next, uh, is Seth Zuckerman, who's the executive director of Northwest Natural Resource Group, a Seattle-based nonprofit that promotes the use of ecological forestry in Washington and Oregon. He's the co-author of a forthcoming book titled A Forest of Your Own, the Pacific Northwest Handbook of Ecological Forestry, to be published this spring by, by Mountaineers Books. So congratulations, Seth, on that big achievement, and uh, please take the mic. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Micah, for that introduction and, and to WCA uh, for hosting us here today. Um, and uh, in the, the slides I'm going to present, you'll see some images, most of which appear also in this forthcoming book. Um, so I want to just say that uh, this idea, and if we can move on to the next slide, please, uh, this idea that uh, forestry might be more climate smart and might contribute to climate mitigation and resilience is of a piece with a larger trend where society is, is starting to expect more from the forest and from those who manage it. Uh, these guys sitting here on this log in 1916, nobody was saying to them, hey, we want you to practice some more climate aware forestry uh, for the first more than a century of the timber industry in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it was all it was all just about jobs and timber. But then that started to change. And if you go on to the next slide, please, uh, we started to add, started to expect that forest owners would also supply clean water and wildlife habitat and protect endangered species from salmon runs to spotted owls. And so now, if you go on to the next slide, they were uh, looking for climate mitigation and climate resilience. Uh, that's just part of this this larger trend. Um, and when you think about it, though, uh, if we go on to the next slide, uh, please. Um, this idea of climate aware forestry, it seems like a tall order, but in theory, who wouldn't want to practice it, right? Um, if you know any of us who've been to a, a forestry or civil culture class probably remember this, this old graph, uh, if you're doing even aged management, uh, the periodic annual increment, the amount of growth that happens each year, that peaks fairly early on. But uh, because it's so much higher than what it was in the early years of the stand's development, the mean annual increment, the average productivity of the stand over the course of, uh, of its lifetime uh, peaks much later, say around anywhere from 70 to 100 years, depending on the site and the, the conditions, at least here on the west side. Uh, and so from a, the standpoint of timber productivity and maximizing uh, what we could get economically from the stand, you'd want to raise the forest to an older age, which coincidentally means they'd be sequestering more carbon on each acre. They'd be pulling more carbon out of the air and uh, also and therefore contributing to climate mitigation. Um, now, along the way to that potential final or, or regeneration harvest around age 80, um, there would also be thinning. And thinning would not only provide income and revenue and product along the way, but it would also inc increase the climate resilience of the stand. What we know about the Pacific Northwest uh, under conditions of climate change is it's expected to see hotter and drier summers 
which means that there will be less soil moisture available, which means that if you reduce the number of stems per acre, that soil moisture can be shared among fewer trees and therefore uh, likely increasing the health and vigor of, of the forest and enabling it to continue developing longer into the future. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, um, there are nevertheless barriers in the way to people practicing this kind of forestry. Uh, and so through our work uh, as part of this consortium that pursued this uh, Climate Smart Commodities Grant, there are a couple of these barriers that we're trying to tackle along with uh, offering a carrot. And so I'm gonna talk about the barriers that we think we can address, the barrier we don't think we can address and the way in which we hope to offer a carrot to increase more climate savvy or climate aware or climate smart forestry. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the barriers, and I mentioned thinning as a, a technique along the way to uh, practicing uh, that's part of the whole package of climate smart forestry. Uh, if you want to thin the forest, you have to contend with the fact that partial harvest costs more, costs the landowner more per thousand board feet than a regeneration harvest. It's more time consuming and requires more skill to maneuver around the trees that you're going to leave behind. And so as part of this, uh, this grant, uh, we're going to be able to offer incentives to producers who participate. Uh, one that is a per acre payment that helps defray this additional cost, but not cover it entirely, uh, as well as payment towards the cost of equipment mobilization. And if you're not someone who regularly arranges for logging uh, on your property, equipment mobilization just means the cost of moving the equipment in to do the job and then moving out, it out again later. And that, particularly on smaller jobs, is a barrier in the way of the economic viability of a, uh, of a partial harvest. Um, next slide, please. Another barrier that we are hoping to address, and this is you know, uh, a working hypothesis that we're going to test over the course of the, the five years of this grant, is that there's been a shortage of timber operators who can practice this kind of thinning. And so to address that, uh, we're intending to uh, uh, roll out some specialized training programs where loggers with experience and skill at thinning can share their skills with trainees both people who are already in the logging business, as well as some who are in logging adjacent businesses, such as heavy equipment operation or truck drivers who might want to get into the business of becoming timber operators. Um, and then particularly for smaller jobs, uh, I mentioned the cost of equipment mobilization. Uh, we believe that uh, thinning will be more economically viable with a piece of equipment that's depicted here. It's, a, uh, it's called a harwarder. A uh, combination of a harvester and forwarder. Uh, so the harvester part of it uh, cuts the trees, delims them, and cuts them to length, manufactures logs out of them that can be, then be shipped to the mill. And then the forwarder part, which is the, the bunk on the back that carries the trees, or a clam bunk that can drag longer logs behind it, uh, then hauls it all out. And so by being able to log with just one piece of equipment, uh, the theory is, which we will, like I say, test in the course of these five years, the theory is that uh, partial harvest will become more viable, particularly on smaller pieces of ground, and that that thinning will increase both, will increase the climate resilience of, of those stands. Next slide, please. The barrier that we don't think that we can address is uh, the barrier that comes, th that is experienced by land managers who are focused entirely on increasing the ROI, their return on investment for their investors. And if you have to meet a given hurdle rate, uh, then uh, the incentives that we've thought we, that we think we can offer uh, to address barriers number one and two, uh, we don't think will be sufficient necessarily. And probably not even if we find uh, the holy grail that people have aspired to over perhaps the last 30 years, uh, next slide please, of, um, of a carrot of actually paying more to landowners and forest managers for raising wood that's in accordance with certain uh, ecological specifications. Now, um, Micah talked about the the port of the Portland Airport project, and that is in some ways a, a paradigm of 
what we hope can be rolled out on larger scale. Some of the producers for that were actually able to receive a premium for their wood in order to meet the ecological and social specifications that the Port of Portland had laid out for their project. And uh, we're hoping that through the work of the downstream of the, uh, what we do with the landowners we work with, that uh, it will be possible then uh, for landowners to receive a premium that will incentivize more of this kind of work, more of this kind of forestry. Um, next slide, please. So with that, um, that that's, that's a wrap on what we're planning to do with landowners. And I'd like to introduce uh, Brent Davies, who has spent the last 25 years working on forest. Seth, I think we've lost your audio. Seth, I can't hear you either. Oh. Uh, back, you're back. Maybe. I think you're back, Seth. Uh, Seth, I think you might be back. Maybe I'll just, shall I just hop on in? I think, can people hear me? We can hear you just fine. I think if you can just keep moving along, that would be great. Okay, super. Well, sorry about that uh, abrupt um, ending there, Seth, but I think you were maybe introducing me and maybe I'll just, just go ahead and say, my name is Brent Davis and I'm now heading up a, a new organization, Vibrant Planet Data Commons. Um, I've been working in the space of forest restoration and protection for the last 20, 25 years. And uh, most recently I was the vice president of forest and ecosystem services for EcoTrust. And now I am focused um, on how we can use data and new technologies to help speed the pace and scale of forest restoration. So we can move on to this, the, the next slide. Um, and I'm just super delighted to be here. Um, thanks for having me. And again, I'll just echo the thanks to the uh, WCA team. Um, and I'm here to present how our Climate Smart Commodities team is measuring our impact uh, currently, the accounting systems that we have available for carbon footprinting of timber products do not recognize the differences in forest management practices, and I think this was alluded to by a couple of the other panelists earlier. And so this means that the way our current life cycle assessments, our environmental product declarations, and the like, the way they measure carbon emissions associated with all wood products, including new wood buildings, is basically to say that all wood is good, all wood is the same, and when it comes to embodied carbon, all wood uh, has a carbon value of zero. In other words, wood is carbon neutral, and you don't have to be a forester to see that there's a really a huge variation in management practices outside on the ground. So with some owners who leave most of their trees behind after a harvest and others who leave far fewer, um, there's just a big variety out there. And these management choices can have a huge impact on carbon. So we can do better than this um, and than these current accounting, accounting systems that ignore what we're seeing right in front of us. So let's go to the next slide. EcoTrust developed a proof of concept tool that has helped us get started. 
quantifying the differences, these differences in carbon impact. And it is uh, this tool, this early proof of concept tool is compatible with national and global standards and aligns with the Climate Smart Wood Group's procurement guide, the draft land sector guidance of the GHG protocol, and it can complement existing EPDs for forest products that currently ignore upstream embodied carbon. And so thanks to this EcoTrust's uh, proof of concept initial tool, we, let's go to the next slide. Thanks to that tool, uh, we have something to build on. And I wanna take a second to show you this, this tool. So I'm gonna share my screen with you, see if we can get on there. I think you should be able to see my screen right now. And this is the tool and there will be a link to it on the, the page I just came away from that slide. And we'll go back to that so you can check it out yourself. Um, it's a pretty simple tool that is showing embodied carbon. And if you can see this, this top line chart is showing timber output by different landowner type. And then this bottom chart is showing forest carbon. And the map is showing the embodied carbon per county over the past few decades where we have data available. So right now this is Powell County, for example, in Idaho. Uh, and then we can just play around with it. You can go over to Tillamook and maybe I was in Montana over here. Um, anyway, so you can just, it's sort of fun and interesting to just look over time. So now we can go back to the slides. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that this uh, extensive research that the Ecotrust team did to develop this early um, proof of concept tool and framework demonstrates the critical role of forest management in embodied carbon and the potential environmental benefits of more informed wood market choices. So not only can we see that the carbon footprint isn't zero, but also that it can be highly variable. So county jurisdiction is the only thing really shown here in this proof of concept tool, but in our Climate Smart Commodities Project, we will show the jurisdictional scale like this in this initial tool, but then we're also going to add individual forest owners and woodsheds and include it as part of our outputs. Uh, they will, all these outputs will align with national and global standards and will we'll also include detailed reports and visuals that share carbon impact summaries, supplier specific reports, geographic and jurisdictional overviews and those sorts of things. We can go to the next slide. So to get to those reports that I was just describing, I just wanna, uh, I'll get into some of the details um, of this slide, but I wanna just highlight that to get to those reports, uh, there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of partnership activity going on between Ecotrust and Vibrant Planet's team and the Vibrant Planet Data Commons team. Um, and so it's a real partnership as we develop the methodology design and design the tool. So uh, Ecotrust at the beginning here uh, of our process, um, they're going to be defining the impact assessment methods which use multiple public data sources to map for impacts over space and time, and which will lead to the design of an extensible framework for measurement, monitoring, and reporting. And then informed by Ecotrust methodology, Vibrant Planet is going to spearhead the development of data pipelines and analytical processes that will bring estimates of forest carbon stocking, disturbance, and timber removals up to the present and into the future. And then, and it's important to know the Vibrant Planet will be using new data that combines both field and satellite data. And this data will be updated on at least an annual basis and subjected to rigorous quality control. These data are then put into models that integrate 
public forest and timber report reporting data to ensure that our outputs are accurate, consistent, and reproducible. And finally, this data will be pulled into an online reporting system that highlights the forest impacts associated with timber production across the contig contiguous US. And we will make available maps and reports and data visualizations that are all informed by an extensive user needs assessment. And you can go to the next slide. And here you can see um, our timeline, and we're just launching our user needs assessment, and we will begin the uh, co the qualitative research in early 2024, which will be followed up by the design and development of prototypes, and then software development will begin in 2025 with a target release date of 2027. Um, it's a really going to be an iterative uh, process. We'll have um, testing, tool testing with the target users throughout. Um, it's, uh, we're, as I said, we're just in the user needs assessment stage. Um, and it's a really important stage um, to help make sure that we're guided by the actual users in the design and development of our application so that it effectively meets their needs. So you can go to the next slide. So this is just really to invite you to participate. So I imagine that there are some potential users of our tool want to see uh, what uh, the details of our carbon uh, impacts tool. So um, I invite you to get in touch with us, either me directly or David Diaz at EcoTrust or the leaders of our user needs assessment, Alistair at VP Data Commons and Sarah Klein, S. Klein at EcoTrust. And I wanna also highlight that if you don't see your community reflected in this diagram of users, but see a use that you're interested in, please don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us. So that's a wrap for me. And I'm handing it back over to Aaron. All right. Thanks so much, Brent, and uh, to all our panelists. And so at this uh, at this point in the presentation, we look forward to a uh, robust Q&A. Um, and we've got some, some excellent, I've gotten some excellent ones in the uh, Q&A section uh, of the toolbar. If you haven't had a look at those that have been sort of answered while we're in process, uh, please do that. But for the uh, sort of live ones, um, there was a question that's uh, that's gotten a number of uh, responses from Timothy uh, uh, Leadingham regarding sort of civil cultural approaches and by extension the the intended meaning of climate smart forestry and and so I think this is an important one to uh, kick around a little bit more on a sort of threshold question level and the reason is that you know we sort of uh, conflate this conversation sometimes with subjects like certification or environmental regulation and and that's really not what this initiative is about it's uh it's to recognize that there are some tenets to what makes force management decisions uh climate smart but they exist along a continuum from uh you know great and and optimal to more you know uh, suboptimal let's say and uh, uh, the reason that that is significant to me is because, you know, in building something that's that's realistic and scalable, uh, we need a, a national network of climate smart forestry uh, practitioners and and also to find ways of scaling their approaches or uh, sort of quantifying their approaches, if you will, uh, in order that the marketplace can react to it in a way that's sort of efficient. And I'm really happy that you know, in the early stages of our work on this, we're building a transcontinental uh, sort of North American coalition of those exact practitioners. They may or may not call their work climate smart forestry, and in fact, probably few of them do. But whether they're a, 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 a small forest landowner or an industry landowner or a land trust or an agency, uh, people are practicing forestry across the infinite variety of the ecosystems that they're they're working in. And, you know, our charge is to try and put a framework together that, that enables the 
the builders that are interested in in this sort of higher performing material to get access to it in a way that's uh, that's efficient. Um, but you know, specific to the Climate Smart Commodities Grant and and the landowners and projects that are envisioned uh, in the sort of roster of participants, I wondered if uh, Seth, you might begin with sort of talking a little bit about the the range of silviculture that that's involved. And, and Micah, if you want to add in, that'd be fantastic. Is this, is this working now? Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. On. It's on. Yeah. Sorry about that before. Um, so the range of silviculture, and I think that it's, you know, it's, it needs to be somewhat site specific, but, uh, you know, in a general, uh, I would say some of the things that we're looking towards are extended rotations, uh, extended compared to uh, the short rotation industrial forestry practice, uh, diversifying species, um, Cre uh, you know, planting uh, uh, seed or seed using seed lots from provenances that are more apt to be uh, suitable for the changed climate of uh, the you know twenty fifties and beyond. Um, there are um, you know on the east on the east side, it's going to be somewhat different. Uh, there'll be a greater focus, I would say, on resilience and wildfire. Uh, you know, uh, making a, the landscape suitable to, accom to uh, accommodate low intensity, high frequency uh, burning that was um, more common to that fire regime, um, as, as opposed to climate mitigation, which would be, might, might be more the, the focus on the west side. Micah, anything to add? Just, and I put this in a typed response to that, but we do have a a list of practices that NRCS has approved us to uh, support under under this grant. And we tried to make that as broad as possible for the reasons that Seth mentioned is that it's quite site specific, quite landowner specific. Um, and especially because we'll be working with uh, a number of tribes with this grant, um, we want to make sure that cultural values are also incorporated in uh, the management options that we put on the ground. So for anybody who's interested in knowing what that full list is, uh, just find my email, I think on the presentation that's going out and I'd be happy to share it. I won't, I won't dig into it just for the sake of time right now though. Yeah. And so Climate Smart Wood Group importantly does have a sort of framework, very high level definition that, uh, that tries to sort of, you know, just explain what we're talking about uh, in in a, in a way again that accommodates a, a broad continuum of practices, and and that's on the Climb Smart Wood Group website, uh, climbsmartwood.net. If you go and click on forests, there's the uh, the broad definitional framework. But as you can kind of see, when, even when you break it down into the region where we're sort of rooted, uh, the the iterations and and uh, a variety of practices that might be involved in it are um, are, are variable. So we're trying to. Uh, make it realistic, make our approach realistic from that standpoint. Uh, Brian, uh, and, and do, do we have a couple more minutes time for one last question, do you think? I think we do. Uh, feel free to take one or two more questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, the question was also asked, and there's a bit of discussion around it in the, in the Q&A about how we're playing, or planning to track Climate Smart Wood through the supply chain. And, and for the uninitiated, uh, that is an extraordinarily complicated task, and particularly, again, when you're trying to do it at scale. Uh, frequently, you have, obviously, uh, sawmills and other primary wood-producing facilities that source their material from, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of different landowners. And, uh, and when those logs are mixed together on their way through the mill, it, it becomes really quite difficult, obviously, to pull specific logs out and know their provenance. Um, and so, the, you know, I'd say the intermediate term uh, strategy is to make it a bit easier and more efficient to do that on a building project by building project type of basis where you're working with an, an owner of a building project and their their architecture, engineering and, and construction firms who know how to do this and, and try and work directly with the supply chain itself to find willing landowners and then uh, uh, downstream manufacturing partners who uh, want to serve that demand. Uh, so it's a bit one off and and you have to have a uh, a client that's really committed and dedicated to it. But fortunately, that demand is increasing. And, and that's really part of the reason why uh, we exist at all as far as Climate Smart Wood Group is concerned. Um, and 
I think the other thing that's important to know about that, if again, if you haven't thought much about it, is that if you picked that question up and dropped it in uh, Maine, the answer to it would be vastly different than, you know, in Oregon, Washington, and that that too would be vastly different from the answer to that question in uh, Minnesota or uh, Arizona. So uh, really, it's it's about tapping into um, the the people and practitioners to start with, and then figuring out what's scalable from from there. And that's again where putting this Climate Smart Commodities Grant project on the ground in the Northwest region is going to tell us a lot about what can be successful. And so, Micah and Seth, do you want to uh, again add uh, a bit around? You know how we're planning to to carry that out in the in the northwest. Um, I was I'm sorry I was busy typing response to Chris in the chat there. Can you can you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, yeah, the the supply chain uh, approach that uh, the Climate Smart Commodities Grant Program is uh, is going to adopt in order to be able to track the material. Right. Well. Uh, I replied also to another message sort of on that topic where, um, yes, certification is a useful uh, tool and, and ideally is one tool in a ever increasing tool belt that enables you to understand more about the forest that your wood is coming from. Um, so essentially what, what this overall effort is doing is trying to correct for a lack of transparency um, available to wood consumers. Uh, to the demand market. And so th to some degree, the uh, impact measurement effort that Brent described will enable that sort of estimation from a top-down approach uh, based on satellite data. Um, you, we will be able to attribute carbon stocking to wood products that are coming from various, from uh, different landowner owner types at a county scale. We're also working sort of from a bottom. Satellite point. and field data. Satellite and field data. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we're also working from a bottom up approach through engagement directly with uh, producers, as described here, but also with mills and manufacturers. We've got a growing uh, range of partners that are on the sort of middle of the supply chain or in, in the middle of the supply chain who. Uh, you know, it's a trust building exercise, there are economics involved. And we've found that through uh, direct engagement and clarity about what it is we're trying to do, as well as the right products to, you know, guarantee that customers are on the other side of the effort that it takes a mill or a manufacturer to adopt um, some of these tracking and tracing efforts that we've actually seen quite a bit of success and cooperation from our friends in the manufacturing and, and mill industry. So really it, it at this stage comes down to creating the tools that make it possible for a consumer to, to uh, track this stuff, as well as creating the networks and the relationships that uh, are key to developing sort of trust as we're, you know, doing supply chain innovation, I guess, is what I would say in a, in a short way. Um, happy to engage more on that. There are some, I, I described a few sort of specific steps that have, we've seen success with um, in, in a uh, text response. Awesome. Um, there are a bunch more questions, but uh, uh, we are at time, unfortunately. And so I will uh, close with uh, uh, another thank you to WCA and Rachel for putting this uh, opportunity together to talk about this project we're all really excited about. And to my uh, my esteemed colleagues, uh, Brent and Seth and Micah, for, for your help and expertise here. Um, and I just tell everybody that, uh, you know, Climate Smart Wood Group is a, a coalition uh, and, and uh, network organization. And, you know, your thoughts on this, this initiative uh, are are valued and welcome. And, uh, you know, we have all kinds of different ways that you can be involved with our organization. And all you need to do is reach out and talk to me. And I know that I speak for the rest of the panelists when uh, I say that if you have any questions about their work or want to engage on their work, they would welcome that as well. So our, our uh, contact information ought to be available, available, eh, available to you relatively easily. And I look forward to talking with anybody else who wants to talk. Thanks so much, Aaron, and all. I'm very lucky to have the opportunity to work with all you folks, um, including in this project that comes ahead. 
So thanks everyone for attending the session. We'll take a, a break for a few minutes and start back up at 2.05. See you here. <laughs>